Welcome to the deep dive, where we uh, really dig into the nitty gritty of complex topics and try to unearth some fascinating insights. And today we're going to Baltimore. We have a housing dispute that seems pretty straightforward at first glance, but it takes us on this deep dive into alleged discrimination. And get this, historic tax credits are involved. Yeah, you'd be surprised how often these tax credits, which are often seen as a force for good in you know neighborhood revitalization, they end up at the heart of these really complicated situations. So let's set the stage here. Our story begins in October of 2019. We have a Baltimore resident, Nicholas Miles, and he files a housing discrimination complaint with HUD. Right. Right from the get-go, this sounds serious. Yeah, it does. And the situation, I think, only gets more serious when you understand who this complaint is actually filed against. Mm -hmm. We're talking about Historic East Baltimore Community Action Coalition, Inc. They're referred to as the developer in the documents. Mm -hmm and a resident agent by the name of Danielle S. Zoller. Hmm. Okay, so we have, what, like a classic David and Goliath situation brewing here? Yeah. Yeah, it seems that way. What exactly happened between uh, Miles and these respondents, as they're called in the documents? Well, at the core of Miles' complaint is this allegation that he faced discrimination based on his race. Specifically, he's alleging that he was treated unfairly because he is black, and this all allegedly occurred at his residence at 901 North Port Street. Okay, 901 North Port Street. Now, it's important to note that simply alleging discrimination isn't necessarily enough in a legal setting, right? I mean, there needs to be more to a claim than just feeling like you were treated unfairly. So what specific evidence does Miles present to support his case? And this is where things get really interesting. Miles points to an agreement that he claims he had with the respondents. And this agreement concerned historic tax credits that were associated with the property. Hold on a second. Before we go any further, can you unpack this whole historic tax credits thing for us? What are they and how could they possibly factor into a housing discrimination case? You're right. I jumped ahead a bit there. Sorry about that. Historic tax credits, they're basically federal tax incentives. And they're given to developers to rehabilitate historic buildings. Um, you know, it's meant to encourage investment in these older neighborhoods, preserve those architectural gems. And oftentimes homeowners in these revitalized properties, they might be promised a share of these tax credits as part of their agreement with the developer. Oh, OK. So Miles is saying he was promised a piece of this financial pie, but then ultimately denied his slice. Exactly. He claims that the respondents basically reneged on their promise. And crucially, he believes this all happened because of his race. Wow. That is a serious accusation. How does he substantiate this claim, though? Is there anything more, aside from just being denied these benefits, to suggest that his race was a factor? Well, this is where it gets even more interesting. So, Miles tries to support his case by drawing a comparison with other homeowners, presumably non-Black homeowners, and he claims that they receive their due share of the tax credit proceeds. Ah, so he's suggesting a pattern of disparate treatment, like he was singled out. Exactly. Because of his race. Exactly. The similarly situated argument. Uh, okay. Yeah, that's going to be crucial, I'm sure. But you mentioned there's more to this case than just these tax credits. What else did Miles allege? You're right. The plot thickens here. Yeah. So in addition to that alleged tax credit discrepancy, Miles claims that he experienced persistent difficulties in getting home warranty repairs addressed. Imagine you're dealing with, like, a leaky roof or faulty plumbing and you suspect you're being ignored because of your race. It's a very stressful living situation to be in, for sure. Very much so. Okay, so let's go back to the tax credit issue for just a moment. Legally speaking, what arguments might Miles' team use to support his claim that he was denied these tax credit proceeds because of his race? And what kind of evidence would they need to prove intent in this kind of situation? Yeah, proving intent in a discrimination case, it's really tricky. It often involves demonstrating a pattern of behavior that suggests a bias against a particular group. So in this instance, Miles' legal team would likely focus on gathering evidence that demonstrates that similarly situated homeowners, and by that I mean those who are in a comparable position to him with regard to this tax credit agreement, but were not black, were treated more favorably. Right. So we're comparing apples to apples, so to speak. Exactly. And this could involve comparing contracts, communication records, maybe even testimonies from those other homeowners. It sounds like building a successful case hinges on really meticulously documenting every interaction, every transaction, just to establish this clear pattern of disparity. And it makes you wonder about, you know, the power dynamics that are at play in a situation like this, you know, where one party might have more access to legal resources or financial leverage than the other. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. What happened next in this case? Well, 
Fast forward to February 5, 2021. So more than two years after Miles initially filed that complaint, and we see a new development. A letter arrives from an unexpected source, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. HUD. HUD, better known as HUD. Okay, so HUD getting involved certainly suggests things are heating up. What does this letter reveal, and what does it mean for Miles's case? So this letter, which was written by Melody Taylor, she's the director of Region the Third Office of Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity, brings news. It lets Miles know that his case, which was under review by the Maryland Commission on Civil Rights, is being reactivated and is being sent back to HUD for further scrutiny. So after what sounds like a bit of bureaucratic ping pong, the case lands back on HUD's plate. What prompted this shift back to the federal level? Well, the letter doesn't really delve into the specifics of why the case was sent back to HUD, but it does highlight an interesting detail. This all unfolded during the peak of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the letter even mentions how a pandemic really significantly impacted HUD's operations. They had to adapt their administrative complaint processes to a largely virtual format. It's just a stark reminder that the pandemic's impact on something as seemingly unrelated as a housing discrimination case, it's just wild. Its effects were everywhere. But let's put a pin in the pandemic's role for now. I'm curious to understand what this shift back to HUD actually means for Miles's case. Does it signal a renewed focus on his allegations? Well, I can't imagine what that must have felt like for Nicholas Miles, having his case kind of bounce back to HUD after more than two years. Navigating those bureaucratic channels is tough enough as is, let alone during a pandemic. That's a lot. It really is. It just highlights that crucial role that HUD plays in all of this, you know, making yeah. sure those fair housing practices are actually happening. For sure. Speaking of HUD, let's talk about the legal framework surrounding this case for a moment, specifically the Fair Housing Act. What exactly is it and how does it apply to Miles' allegations? So the Fair Housing Act, often shortened to just the FHA, is this really landmark piece of legislation. It was passed back in 1968. And it's essentially a cornerstone of civil rights law here in the United States. It's meant to ensure equal opportunity in housing for everyone. So it's about making sure everyone has a fair shot at finding a place to live no matter their background. You got it. The FHA prohibits discrimination based on a number of protected characteristics. So oh. This includes race, color, national origin, religion, sex. Oh, yeah. And when I say sex, that also includes things like pregnancy and sexual orientation. Yeah. And familial status, disability. It's interesting that you mentioned familial status. I don't know. I wouldn't have immediately associated that with like race or religion or something like that. But it makes sense considering, you know, the historical context of housing discrimination in this country. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I think it's a good reminder that discrimination, it can manifest in many, many forms. And it often targets characteristics that have been historically used to marginalize or exclude certain groups. And the FHA, it aims to basically dismantle those barriers, create a more equitable housing landscape for everyone. Right, right. Okay, so the FHA exists to prevent discrimination in housing. How does that connect to Miles's case specifically? Well, Miles's allegations, if they're proven true, could very well constitute violations of the Fair Housing Act. Remember, he claims he was treated differently with regard to both the tax credit agreement and the home warranty repairs. And he believes this different treatment stems from his race. Okay, so just to be clear, if his claims about, let's say, being given the runaround on those repairs, if those are found to be true, and there's evidence suggesting this only happened because he's black, that would be a violation of the Fair Housing Act. Exactly. The FHA isn't just about, you know, preventing an outright refusal to rent or sell a property based on someone's race it covers a much broader range of discriminatory practices. This includes disparate treatment in things like the terms of a lease, the provision of services, or even just how landlords or property managers respond to repair requests. Yeah, that's a really crucial point and because it means that even like subtle differences in treatment, things that might be easily dismissed or explained away in other contexts can actually be indicative of discrimination under the law. Absolutely. And proving disparate treatment often hinges on this idea of similarly situated individuals, which you mentioned earlier. Right, right. That whole idea of comparing apples to apples, how does one even go about establishing that someone is similarly situated in a case like this? It's a critical question, but it's complicated. To demonstrate that someone was treated differently because of a protected characteristic like race, you have to be able to show that others who weren't of that race but were otherwise in a comparable position were actually treated more favorably. 
So in Miles's case, his legal team would need to demonstrate that non-black homeowners who were also party to this tax credit agreement or who had, you know, similar home warranty issues were treated differently. You got it. But it's not just about finding any non-black homeowner. They'd have to prove that these individuals were truly similarly situated. And this means having like comparable financial backgrounds, similar interactions with the respondents, similar types of repair requests, all that. The list can go on and on. Yeah. It sounds like proving similarly situated can get really nuanced, very fact specific. Is there a risk of going down a rabbit hole of just these minute details? Could it be really, really challenging to build a successful case? There's always that risk. And that's why these cases can be so, so challenging. It becomes this really meticulous process of comparing and contrasting situations, looking for those patterns of behavior that might suggest that a bias was actually at play. And it wasn't just a series of unfortunate coincidences or you know misunderstandings. Yeah, it's easy to see how this gets complicated quickly. Uh -huh. And it really underscores the importance of documentation, right? Like every email, every phone call, every interaction matters. It really does. Could potentially be a piece of the puzzle. Absolutely. <laughs> and, you know, it's not just about the legal case itself. These kinds of situations can have a really, really profound impact on the people who are directly involved. Just imagine the stress, the uncertainty of feeling like you're being discriminated against, especially in your own home. Yeah. A place where you're supposed to feel safe and secure. It's a good reminder that these cases are about much more than just legal arguments and technicalities. Right. They're about real people grappling with potentially really unfair and unjust treatment. It's just, it's disheartening to think that, you know, anyone would have to go through that, that kind of stress and uncertainty, especially in their own home. And it makes you realize how important organizations like HUD are, right? Absolutely. They're there to investigate these claims. They're there to protect people's rights. Yeah. They play a crucial role. It's about, you know, leveling the playing field and making sure everyone has equal access to housing, safe housing, fair housing, yeah. regardless of your background or your circumstances. Right. Right. OK. So we've talked about Nicholas Miles's allegations. We've talked mm -hmm. about, you know, how complicated it can be to actually prove discrimination. We've even touched on the legal framework here with the Fair Housing Act. So for you, what stood out the most from all of this? You know, I think when you really dig into the specifics of this case, the thing that really makes me wonder is this agreement that Miles mentioned. The one about the tax credits. Yeah, yeah, that one. It's like this thread that if you pull it, it, it could just unravel this whole other layer of this story, you know? I see what you mean. It's like we've only heard Miles' side of the story so far, right? Exactly. He says there was this agreement, but what form did that agreement actually take? Was it a formal contract? Was it like a handshake deal? Was it something in between? Right. And even if there was a documented agreement, you know, being able to prove that there was a breach of contract and then also proving that that breach was motivated by racial discrimination. Those are two very different things. Yeah. It's a lot. It really is. A lot of questions. Were there like specific clauses in this agreement, this alleged agreement that were directly related to race or ethnicity? Yeah. And were there any legitimate reasons, you know, non-discriminatory reasons why the respondents might not have followed through on their end of the bargain? Like maybe there were unforeseen financial complications or changes in the project scope. We don't know. Right. Uncovering those details, that's what could really help us understand, you know, if Miles's claims hold water or if there's more to the story. Right. Right. It's like putting together this giant puzzle. Yeah. And each piece of information, you know, each document, each testimony, it could unlock a whole new understanding of what happened. Totally. And sometimes, so, even with all the pieces, mm -hmm. even when you think you've got it all figured out, the full picture, still not quite clear. It just goes to show you these cases, they're rarely black and white. Rarely. There are so many shades of gray, so many nuances. It can be really, really tough to figure out what actually happened and whether discrimination played a role. That's the thing. It's about digging deeper. You got to examine all those angles. And sometimes you just have to grapple with those ambiguities to try to reach a fair and just resolution. It reminds you that even in a world that's increasingly driven by data and documentation, you know, it's still those human stories and perceptions and experiences that are at the heart of these really complex issues. It is. And it's those stories that remind us why, you know, fighting for fairness and equality in housing, it's more important now than ever, I think. I agree. Well said. Well, I think that about wraps it up for this deep dive into this world of alleged housing discrimination, historic tax credits, and honestly, just the pursuit of a place to call home that's free from any sort of prejudice or injustice. Absolutely.
Until next time, everyone, keep those thinking caps on, and remember, knowledge is power. <laughs>